Hello and welcome to the Michigan State University Comics Forum. And we are here tonight to welcome our creator, keynote speaker, Kevin Heisinga. My name is Ryan Clater. I'm the director of the MSU Comics Forum. And before we get started, I wanted to chat with you about a few things, starting with our campus and community entities, uh, our sponsors who help this show uh, exist every single year for the past 14 consecutive years. So I'd like to start with our bronze sponsors who are the Michigan State University Comic Art and Graphic Novel Podcast and BRD Printing who has been faithfully printing our posters for the Comics Forum every single year except this year. <laughs> Regardless, I'd still like to thank them for a job well done uh, for so many years. Uh, the only reason it didn't happen this year is because everything is online and we didn't need posters. Um, the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities, as well as the MSU Special Collections Library, which if you are not aware of, is home to the largest public collection of comic books in the entire world. We also have some silver sponsors like Matrix, the Center for Digital Humanities and Social Sciences, MSU Muslim Studies, who is sponsoring a reading discussion on Wednesday of this coming week. Gary Hoppenstand, a professor in the English department who has been a staunch supporter of comic studies uh, ever since I've been here <laughs> and probably a lot longer than that. We also have gold sponsors who are the Michigan State University Main Library where this event is held in person typically uh, aside from this year. So thank you to the Michigan State University Main Library. We hope to see you again next year. The Journal of Popular Culture, as well as the MSU Department of English and the Department of Art, Art History and Design at Michigan State University. And we also have the Mich Michigan State University Comic Art and Graphic Novel Minor, which is an interdisciplinary minor between the art and English departments at MSU and is housed in the art department. And finally, our platinum sponsor is the College of Arts and Letters at Michigan State University. And together, all of these entities help to make the Michigan State University Comics Forum happen every single year. So uh, I'm going to pretend that there is an applause track right here because there should be. Uh, thank you to everyone for making this happen. Now, outside of those entities, we also have a number, oh, and here is, <laughs> my email address in case you are interested in becoming a sponsor for the MSU Comics Forum in the future. Uh, so as I was saying, in addition to those uh, entities, there's also a number of individuals who make this event happen every year. And I'd like to start with Jonah Magar. Now, Jonah Magar started as our venue liaison a couple years back when our event moved to the Michigan State University Main Library and uh, he helps everything run very smoothly when we are in person and his duties have shifted over the course of the years um, and this is no different as we are now completely online and Jonah is staffing the uh, live stream every moment of the day <laughs> for today, for tomorrow, for the entire time. I think he is the person who has seen the most comics forum programming of anybody of us. So Jonah, I know you're behind the scenes. Thank you so much for everything you do for us. You are a, a completely invaluable resource for the Comics Forum. James Curtis is our promotions coordinator. And despite being a, a very busy fellow, he um, helps you, uh, fair listener, know about the Comics Forum. So if you heard about this, it's probably because of James Curtis. So James, thank you for helping get the word out about the show. We also have an Artist Alley coordinator. And before I introduce you to our new Artist Alley coordinator, I'd like to thank Anthony Robinson just briefly for his past couple years of service in the role of Artist Alley coordinator. He's really uh, done a lot to help move this forward. And uh, unfortunately he had to step away, but uh, we really appreciate all the work you've done, Anthony. So thank you so much. But stepping in to fill those very big shoes is Daniel J. Hogan, who is a new Artist Alley coordinator as of this year. And Daniel J. Hogan brings a really unique uh, set of 
uh, qualifications to this position as a former Artist Alley exhibitor. So he's been behind the table at the MSU Comics Forum for a number of years and brings that experience along with uh, really professional, communicative, transparent uh, way of being in the world. So I'm really impressed with how Daniel has taken the reins of Artist Alley coordinator and uh, I hope that he'll be with us for a long time. Zach Cruzy is a name you probably recognize as our panel coordinator from the past. Now, Zach Cruzy, who uh, I need to start calling Dr. Cruzy, uh, recently graduated from his PhD program in English uh, from MSU, has been instrumental in forming what we now know as the academic panel discussions at the MSU Comics Forum. Um, Zach Cruzy has been doing that for the past several years, but is transitioning out of that role into more of an advisory capacity. Uh, nevertheless, I am awfully thankful that Zach is still involved with the Comics Forum. And before I let Zach off the hook, I also want to let everybody watching know that Zach has a new book out called Mysterious Travelers. Uh, this is about Steve Ditko, as you can see from the title, and it's offered from the University of Mississippi Press. Um, you can get it there at their website. You can also find it at any comic book store worth their salt and also other online retailers like Amazon and others. Julian Chambliss is our panel coordinator who is now our fully bona fide panel coordinator. He's been working with Zach Cruzy for a couple of years now. And if you tuned into our YouTube channel at all today, you'll see the amazing roster of people that Julian put together and moderated and who knows what else. Uh, Julian wears a bunch of hats around Michigan State University and I'm awfully thankful that the panel coordinator for the Comics Forum is one of those hats. So thank you very much, Julian, for everything you do. And there's Julian. <laughs> Sharif Abu Saud is our webmaster. So um, he makes sure that our website is not only viewable online on our uh, on desktop and laptop, but also mobile. And when I mess things up, he fixes them. So Sharif, I really appreciate you and everything you do. And finally, my name is Ryan Clater. I'm the director of the forum and you've seen enough of me, but together with all these folks, uh, we help put this on every single year along with our sponsors. So once again, I'm going to pretend that there is an applause track here because these folks deserve it. Thank you so much. Now, before I uh, turn it over to the person that you actually want to hear from today, Kevin Heisinga, uh, I have a bit of an announcement about the future of the Michigan State University Comics Forum. Now, for the past 14 years, the Comics Forum has been an annual event. And starting next year, the Comics Forum are, is going to become a triennial event. So this is the last year we're going to have it annually. And moving into the future, it will happen once every three years. Now, I know that sounds scary, but stick with me here because there's a really great and exciting reason why this is happening. So there is a new partnership that Michigan State University has formed with the Comic Studies Society. And uh, that partnership, if you're, well, first of all, I should probably explain the Comic Studies Society for those who are not familiar with it is an interdisciplinary society open to all who share the goals of promoting the critical study of comics, improving comics teaching, and engaging in open and ongoing conversation about the comics world. So awfully aligned with what we do here at the Comics Forum and with comic studies at Michigan State University. So together, we have formed a partnership to bring the Comic Studies Society International Conference here at MSU in 2022. So the MSU, I'm sorry, the Comic Studies Society International Conference is something that moves around to different universities every single year. But moving into the future, the Comic Studies Society is going to uh, be hosted at MSU every three years, starting in 2022. So moving forward, our schedule is going to look something like this. This year in 2021, 
the MSU Comics Forum will happen. The following year in 2022, the Comic Study Society Conference will take place here. Then in the year that would typically be dark, we plan on having an invited guest, much like we have our uh, internationally known keynote speakers at the Comics Forum, except there's not going to be all the programming surrounding that like you've come to expect at the Comics Forum. So again, if we can project out a little further, it's going to look like this. This is our three year cycle moving forward. Comics Forum, Comic Study Society, invited guest. Comics Forum, Comic Study Society, invited guest. So I hope that this quells some of the fears <laughs> that may have arisen when I said that the Comics Forum is moving from an annual to a triennial event. Uh, it's because we've got this great partnership with the Comic Study Society that we are very excited about. And we feel like between the Comic Study Society and our world-class collection we have here at Michigan State University, in addition to all the other comics resources, the MSU Comics Podcast, the Comics Forum, the minor course of study, and all the faculty associated with comic studies at MSU, uh, this is really a destination spot for comic studies. So um, I will be posting a note about this after the Comics Forum weekend is over on our website. I did not post that yet because I really want the focus to be on the programming of this weekend and into next week. But once the dust settles, uh, you'll be able to see an announcement about this on the homepage of our website moving forward. All right. So uh, with that said, uh, if you do have any questions about this, you can always email me at this email address, director MSUCF or MSU Comics Forum at gmail.com. And that'll go directly to me. All right. So with that out of the way, uh, let's talk about why we're here today, why we're here this evening. And this is for our creator keynote speaker, Kevin Heisinga. Now, Kevin Heisinga's graphic novels include Curses, The Wild Kingdom, Gloriana, and the recently released The River at Night. His work has been translated into six languages, garnered five Ignatz Awards, nominations for Harvey's and Eisner's, and appeared in The New Yorker, Time Magazine, and others. Heisinga lives in Minneapolis, where he has taught in the comic art program at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And in 2020, The Guardian named Heisinga's The River at Night one of the best comics of the past decade. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Kevin Heisinga. Kevin, thank you so much for coming to the MSU Comics Forum and presenting as our keynote speaker tonight. Hello, hello. Am I on? Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch over to try to share my screen. Let's see. Is that working? Looks great to me. All right. All right. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, and uh, well, I can't uh, help but acknowledge the fact that normally we'd all be in the same room. Um, and maybe we'd hang out all night, you know. Uh, but hopefully uh, everyone's comfortable wherever in the world you are uh, and you have your drink and your good chair. <clears throat> thanks uh, so much to Ryan Clater uh, for inviting me to talk and for his uh, patience and help along the way. Um, I talked to him way back at the uh, San Diego Comic-Con about this. Seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, and thank you uh, to Michigan State University for putting on uh, this comics forum. Uh, really amazing, uh, valuable thing. Uh, uh, and thanks for your support uh, for comics uh, over the years. Um, I have a, a Michigan story uh, Michigan State story to tell. <clears throat> um, I, went, um, I went to college in Grand Rapids, Michigan, about an hour west of East Lansing, where Michigan State is. When I was, when I was a sophomore, um, I heard about the huge collection of comics at the library uh, in Michigan State. Uh, 
I woke up early on Saturdays and I drove to East Lansing to get to the library as soon as I could after it opened. And I'd spend the whole day at the library asking for things from the archives. Uh, a lot of the time I just read old comics journals though, <clears throat> uh, which would often suggest other things to ask for. Um, this is, the, uh, this is a, a picture of the old, um, the old reading room. Uh, I'm the kind of person whose happiest place on earth is something like the archives room of a university library. And I'm grateful forever to MSU for uh, those heavenly Saturdays um, back in the late 90s. Uh, in those days, the reading room was in the basement, windowless. I want to be young again. Here, the, here, the new, here is the new special collections room. Uh, I hope I'm able to see it someday. I was hoping to see it this weekend at the Comics Forum, but oh well, uh, oh well. Uh, I'm, I'm also grateful, uh, especially to Randy Scott, who worked on that collection for decades and who, as uh, Ryan Clater said, literally wrote the book on comics librarianship. So special shout out to him. Uh, when I saw this picture of him, of course, my eyes were led to the comics in the background over his shoulder. And I was like, what are those? Hmm. Okay, so that um, those visits were, uh, you know, the year 1998, when I was around 22 years old. Now I'm 44 years old. Uh, there's a lot of ground between now and then, and there's a lot of ground between then and when I drew my very first page of comics. Um, when I drew the first page of comics I ever drew, I lived in South Holland, Illinois, uh, a south suburb of Chicago. It was like 1991. Uh, and you see uh, Lansing, Michigan up here uh, near the top right. And I went to college in Grand Rapids over here. Uh, and incidentally, I also wanna point out that South Holland, Illinois is connected to Holland, Michigan, right here. Um, <clears throat> the Dutch immigrant people who are my people came over to Holland, Michigan, and then some of them moved down to Chicago and then also out to a little village they named South Holland. So that's how it's connected. Uh, so anyways, I drove back and forth between Chicago and Grand Rapids a lot. Um, and in between uh, GR and Chicago, there are two towns, one named Ganges and one named Glen. You can see them on the right uh, there in the, in the red ovals. And here's a picture of the Hello. sign near the, high, near the exit off the highway to those two towns. I drove past that sign many times, and it wasn't until a few years later when I graduated from college and was working on a comic story that I needed a name for the character, and voila, Glen Ganges. So uh, I'll talk more about Glen Ganges in a minute. Uh, so in 2019, I finished up my book, The River at Night, and I had a little free time, and I realized that I had never actually visited either of those places. I had been using Glen Ganges for 20 years, and I had been in and around Chicago a million times, but it had never occurred to me to just drive on up to Southwest Michigan and poke around and see what was going on in Glen or Ganges. So Iona and I drove up there. <clears throat> you can see on the right here is a screenshot of my phone. There's Ganges right there. And you can see here on the right, it says Vivekananda Retreat Center. Well, in Ganges, Michigan, there's a pretty big Vedanta Retreat Center. And I was definitely interested in seeing that. Um, so we drove out there and there was a really big campus, but totally empty at the time. We found someone, uh, the place was empty except for a caretaker. I tried to explain to him about uh, Glenn Ganges, but the caretaker said, it's okay, you don't have to explain, I don't care. Uh, so anyway, here's, uh, I took a lot of pictures of this amazing empty, uh, empty campus, empty retreat center, but there's a picture there on the right. Amazing place. Okay, so going back to the comics journal. Uh, here's some covers of the old comics journals from the 1980s, when it was mostly about superheroes still. But as you know, by the early 2000s, comics had diversified, if mostly in subject matter and form, uh, and the comics journal had shifted. And if you look there in the middle, you'll see issue number 300. And if you look at the cover, you'll see there at the top, my name and Art Spiegelman's name. I wanted to start here because I've been thinking about this lately uh, as I've been getting older. Um, back in 2009, the Comics Journal devoted issue 300 
to this thing where they got young cartoonists to interview older cartoonists. And the idea was to pair together cartoonists of different generations. Um, here's something I asked Spiegelman in that interview. I said, we've committed our lives to comics, hardcore. And we have these heroes that we think about all the time. And we're heroes, meaning cartoonists, fellow cartoonists, that we think about all the time. And we're always thinking about comics and doing all this work. Do you think that there's some sort of vision of life in cartooning, some values that translate into a fuller sense of life? So when some young cartoonist is like, I'm going to dedicate my life to comics, you know, they're actually taking on a set of values beyond just uh, formal ones. Here's what Spiegelman said. <clears throat> he said, each cartoonist has a unique sensibility, but was bitten by this comics bug, sees things through that particular prism. The only common denominator is that it takes a lot of patience and craft. I'm interested in the hybrid of putting words and pictures together and the narrative and non-narrative elements and how you have to keep juggling to make all that happen. I'm not sure if it leads to an ethos, except one that involves an insane amount of labor for very often uh, for a meager yield. But as a life, it's one of those flow bear lines about choosing between an exciting life and exciting work. <clears throat> I've thought about this question a lot over the years and as I've gotten older. And uh, what I think uh, I'm starting to think nowadays is that it has something to do with something like irony. I'd like to unpack that a little to explain what I mean by that, but I don't want to take up the whole talk with it. So I'll just mention uh, a little bit of this in passing. I know that the word irony is definitely not always a popular concept. And I know some of you out there, even though I can't see you, are probably making a face or shaking your head saying, irony, what? Uh, <clears throat> so let me, let me try to talk about that. Here's a quote from Chris Lanier writing about Rodolf Tupfer, a uh, cartoonist, uh, great ancestor. Um, in this piece, he says, uh, Lanier says, in comics, text and image perform a dance of mutual commentary, not explanation. Two cohabitating modes of expression are yoked together in one singular medium producing a habitat whose primary mode of meaning is divergence, in short, a universe defined by irony. Later, he says, any system that smacks of ideology spurs on top for a sense of dissonant dialectic. The split between word and image becomes roughly the split between theory and practice. The world of ideas is sustained in the narration, but it must always be seen in relation to the actual world, which exists stubbornly on its own terms in the pictures. This is the kind of, I don't know, spiritual depth or spiritual dialectic, I guess, uh, I'm, I'm looking for that I aspire to at, at my best. It means something like a double consciousness, maybe, or a sense that there's a multiple layer joke going on. I don't know exactly. I'm still working it out. But I'll admit to most of the time, I, I just love making pen lines and shapes uh, I don't know, take it all with a grain of salt. Uh, speaking of trying to understand comics uh, and speaking of the comics journal, uh, I, I've always loved the way that the cartoonist Seth breaks comics down as poetry plus graphic design or maybe multiplied by. I think this is a really uh, fundamental insight, something that really helps clarify comics for me. Uh, and it's something I spend uh, time on with students when I teach. Sometimes I think the equation can maybe be reduced to just calligraphy, typography by hand. Anyways, Chris Ware uh, was a big influence on me, uh, even, even ever since high school, uh, and someone who definitely thought deeply about uh, this kind of stuff. The other huge influence on me that I'll single out here is John Porcellino. John uh, is a fellow Midwesterner, and his work is also a kind of uh, calligraphy. From John, I take this uh, vision of comics as concerned with the, the miracle and the poetry of everyday life. <clears throat> and I also take from him the idea of creating uh, your own series, uh, your own series of zines or mini comics over the course of many years and publishing them yourself, um, tapping into punk and alternative networks of uh, culture and distribution. <clears throat> okay. Some of, the, some of the things that my comics are about, the suburbs. 
I grew up in the suburbs. Uh, it's the it's the landscape I know. So my comics have uh, included sprawl and the landscape of the suburbs. Um, noise, not so much anymore, but my early comics. Uh, from where I learned, from Chris Ware, I learned to think of comics as music. And I love the push and pull of signal and noise uh, in music. And I played with noise uh, in my early comics. These are some pages from, from those. Uh, the mind, uh, I'm, I'm interested in displaying and mapping mental, mental experiences and structures, uh, especially in the river at night stories. Excuse me. Over the years, uh, I've also been become interested in meditation. Um, and I take a lot of notes in my sketchbooks, uh, though most of this is still pretty unpublished. Um, also notes about philosophy, uh, which I study in college and still like to read for fun. Um, trying to click forward here. There we go. Uh, video games also show up in my comics from time to time, especially in the story Pulverize, which is about a first person shooter multiplayer game. Uh, and in my Fighter Run comics, I play around with some video game tropes. See those here. So, okay, I'm going to talk about my career in comics a bit. <clears throat> now, I actually wrote a comic. Uh, story named My Career in Comics. So it makes sense for me to just read that story. So here we go. <clears throat> My Career in Comics. I drew, I drew this for the Drawn and Quarterly 25th Anniversary Anthology. My Career in Comics. I started out drawing mini comics in high school, inspired by the work of John Porcelino, Adrian Tomine, I self-published for a while, and then later was published by Drawn and Quarterly, which at the time was still one of the most respected publishers of comics in the world. I created much of my classic period work during this time, but always felt dissatisfied with it. As attention and claim for my work grew, I could only see larger and larger flaws in it. I need to somehow go beyond. D and Q started bugging me about reissuing my early self-published comic series long out of print. Now nah, that stuff is so old. I don't know, you insist, huh? With notes, like Chester? Okay, I'll take a look at my old comics and type up some notes. Yeah, okay. I think it could be interesting. I'm open to it. Around this time, someone brought to my attention the computer program named Photoshop, which had just come out. This was 1991. It opened up all kinds of possibilities for going in and fixing one's pages after they had been drawn by hand. As I looked through my old work, I saw my clumsy attempts at cartooning, painful. I could draw much better now, I hoped. Ugh. I wondered if I could get away with a few minor tweaks to those old pages. They had some value, sure. Why not sand off some of the rough edges? I went out and I bought a scanner. Using the computer, I could make minor adjustments to characters' faces and bring them more in line with my current style with greater facility for designing representations of psychology and physiognomy. I decided to start in on at least fixing the hair, something I had always struggled with in my drawing, which looked glaringly amateurish in these early pages. So I had one of my assistants scan in all the old pages, and then I sat down and began. I nudged a few lines here, rotated a few there, zoomed in and out, erased a bit, drew a bit, etc. Over the coming weeks, as I learned more and more about the possibilities Photoshop opened up for me, I began to see more and more levels of complexity in the cartooning of hair. I fantasized. What if the resolution were so fine that I could zoom in and magic lasso and adjust each individual hair? Imagine that. Cut, paste, rotate, adjust levels. Though I was enjoying fixing old pages, I also began to see exciting possibilities for future stories and how I could do the character's hair, how it would change. And then he, here the, uh, the cartoonist is walking with some friends and one's laughing and the other one's saying, so I said to him, look here. He's laughing, but he's imagining drawing that character's hair, drawing that person's hair. There's his, there's his sketchbook. I had seen, really seen how to cartoon hair. This is when everything changed for me. 
I could almost physically sense it as if in three dimensions, not just the color, the shine, but also feel its texture, its body. My sketchbook filled with combinations of head types and hair types, generating endless ideas for characters and stories. I challenged myself, trying difficult angles and exotic cuts, different brushes and pen techniques, always pushing myself. And women's hair, don't get me started, the styles, the way they turn their head or tilt their necks, their shoulders. The effect the air has on, the effect the air has on hair, a thing to consider. Wind, humidity, and barometric pressure, all can affect the atmosphere and dramatic energy of a sequence. Colors of hair, of light, indoor light, outdoor light, times of day. There's children's hair, rich hair, poor hair, class and hair consciousness. It was becoming clear to me that there was a whole hidden history written in the whorls and scribbles of cartooned hair left in the wake of the human spirit moving in the world. I excitedly planned a series of comics which would make it possible for me to explore these issues and to draw hairstyles from different times and places. I did my best to package my work in entertaining and compelling storylines, but often what I had to say about the heads of human beings could be subtle and difficult and audiences were not always willing to do the work. Here the character is taking off their baseball hat and showing that the hair is connected to the hat. It's a fake, fake hair. More research led to more levels of complexity, led to my output slowed. I grew frustrated with the gaps and lack of rigor in most hair scholarship. As my own files and notes on hair graphics multiplied, I became interested as a purely practical matter in issues of taxonomy and information architecture. DNQ agreed to publish Hair It Is, How to Draw Cartoon Hair. Sales were just okay. I was disappointed. My dream had been to follow it with a series of other expanded editions of workbooks. Here the years began to blur together. My attention was divided among too many projects. Whenever a book was finally finished, sales were low. My marriage fell apart, etc. With savings gone and children in college, I needed to find more steady work. I began teaching at a small cartooning college and found I had a knack for it. He's thinking about the cigarettes because he can't smoke on campus. I was excited by the challenge of reaching a younger generation of cartoonists and passing on my vision and the practice of the path. Remember, there is always a distinction to be made between the hair that you draw and what the reader sees. But it was difficult. Eventually, I left to start my own school. My third wife, Sarah, and I worked so hard. But in the end, I guess the world wasn't ready for the Milwaukee School of Beauty and Sequential Art. Then, as you know, Chicago happened and the resource wars began. Everything changed. Comics grew popular again as cheap light entertainment for soldier citizens. I still have old friends in the industry who threw fill in work my way. Then I died. Now that I'm dead, I keep going back to this one memory from early on around the time I first discovered the path. It was early one morning after breakfast and I was walking to my studio. Suddenly I stopped. I stood there for a few seconds. I paused for just a few seconds thinking about what I would work on that day. Fixing some pages for an anthology for DNQ's 25th anniversary, redoing the hair on some old pages they wanted to reprint. A strong feeling out of nowhere came over me. I was imagining with anticipation the day's work. And I thought how there was nothing else I'd rather be doing. And then for a moment, everything opened up and I felt completely happy. My whole stupid life, my work, everything else appeared before me, clear as day, ordinary, beautiful, not a line out of place. I keep returning to that memory now that I'm dead. Uh, all right, so you get a little sense there maybe of the career. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll, I'll talk some about my published work here. <clears throat> There's too much to get to everything, but I'll, I'll give a sort of general overview, some highlights. Uh, I've drawn and published roughly 40 to 50 uh, comic books and zines. Here's a picture of some of them, a uh, picture taken in the early 2000s. The black and white ones on the top are comics I did in high school with my group of comics friends. Uh, but I also put poetry in some of those. 
you know, classic high school stuff. Uh, we, we realized on our own that we could Xerox our comics and bind them together. This was the, the next major milestone in my young life after starting to draw comics. It was around a year or so later when we started printing up multiple comics, multiple copies with covers and everything stapled together at the local Jewel Osco. This was the beginning, uh, this was the discovery of the joys of community, of being in a gang, in a band, uh, and of being in print. Oh, the joy to be in print, to put something together, to design a book, a cover, the inside covers, and so on. <clears throat> Sorry, I gotta catch up with myself here. So here's uh, Super Monster number seven. My first series of comics was named Super Monster. There were 14 issues. It ended in 2001. In issue number seven pictured here, I tried to write about walking around the neighborhood in Grand Rapids and, and looking at stuff. I tried doing autobio comics when I was young, but I mostly gave it up. Something about it just didn't feel right to me. Even here, you can see that I'm not drawing my face. I'm always drawing the back of my head. I tried to do things like that to make autobio feet autobio feel less about me and more about my world. It was the kind of thing that led to me uh, using Glenn Ganges later. <clears throat> Here's or else number three, jumping ahead a few years. Um, by this point, uh, I was published by Drawn and Quarterly, but I was still drawing mini comics. Uh, I always like this cover. It's one of my best, I think. Uh, I'd like to read this short comic here to you. Um, it's called A Short Stroll. A Short Stroll. I step out of the house for a short stroll. The weather is beautiful, but the street is startlingly empty, except for a municipal employee in the distance who is holding a hose and playing a huge arc of water across the street. Unheard of, I say, and examine the tension of the arc. An insignificant municipal employee, I say, and again, look at the man in the distance. At the corner of the next intersection, two men are fighting. They collide, fly far apart, guardedly approach one another, and are at once locked together and struggle again. Stop fighting, gentlemen, I say. It's uh, from the Diaries of Franz Kafka, uh, June 1914. Uh, this is Curses, uh, my first real book book, uh, my uh, graphic novel. Curses is a book of interrelated short stories that came out in 2006. By this point, Glenn Ganges was the uh, quote unquote star of most of my stories. <clears throat> he was mostly a suburban late twenties, early thirties guy, married. And in this book, he and Wendy try and fail to have a kid. One of the big stories in this book is called Jeepers Jacobs about a theologian who writes an essay for a theology journal defending the uh, traditional view of hell. Uh, Glenn Ganges also appears in the story as Jeeper's golfing partner, uh, but the story is mostly about theology, about hell, and, but some of it's about golfing too. <clears throat> For the record, I have no absolute, I have absolutely no interest in golf, uh, but this was an experiment for me at the time, writing a short story from a neutral perspective. Uh, I was in love with Chekhov at the time, his short stories, uh, and this is uh, strangely uh, what, come, what came of it. This is uh, my book, The Wild Kingdom, which is actually one of my earliest works uh, in the first appearance of Glenn Ganges. I was trying to get at something, something that felt like, uh, in, like an existential trap door opening or like constantly opening below you. What that means uh, in the book is that it's a mixture of TV commercials uh, and it's a nature documentary set in the suburbs uh, and it's weird mysteries all around. Uh, this book is made to look like an old science textbook, uh, as if we can figure out any of, any of it. <clears throat> I've been in love with old science textbooks and diagrams for a long time. I collect, the, I collect old science textbooks. This is another uh, small graphic novel named Gloriana, which uh, is a portmanteau of uh, the name Gloria and the word Iliana. I grew up in Ileana, uh, back and forth over the border, and even went to uh, Ileana Christian High School. The first panel in the middle there of Glenn getting groceries out of the trunk and Wendy looking at the moon, that was the first panel I drew. 
uh, I sat at the, uh, for this book, I sat and drew that panel with nothing else planned. Uh, and then I just kept drawing panel at, after that. And um, before I knew it, I had a whole trilogy of stories. And I learned a lesson when I was doing that, which was to not plan too much and to just start on something and it'll work itself out. One of the stories in Gloriana has to do with the moon illusion, which is when the moon appears large, when it is low on the horizon, because of an optical illusion, the moon appears really large. I tried to explain how this optical illusion worked using sort of science diagrams um, in the book. Uh, I love optical illusions too. Uh, so diagramming is a, part, a big part of what I enjoy about making art and about making comics. Uh, not just diagrams, but diagrams in sequence. Uh, diagrams uh, in comics form that, you, that unfold before you. Um, diagrams that make use of the possibilities of comics. Next, uh, Dan Zetwak and I uh, drew a weekly comic for the Riverfront Times in St. Louis for four years. Uh, and we also put them online. It was called Amazing Facts and Beyond with Leon Beyond. It was a great experience to be like a real cartoonist with a strip in the newspaper. Uh, you know, you could walk around town with your head up high, a real cartoonist, <clears throat> but the, uh, the deadlines were tough. The concept uh, behind the strip was that it was like amazing, it was, it was amazing facts, like Ripley's Believe It or Not, uh, except uh, I think Leon just re really just made up everything himself. <clears throat> Here's some more. I'm, I'm pretty proud of this work. Uh, this is um, another aspect of my work here. It's called Fight or Run. It's a comics game. Uh, anyone can play. It's a straightforward setup where two characters meet and then they fight or they run. Whoever survives or escapes the conflict is named the winner and presented with a flag or a trophy. Endless variations are possible. There is no patent on this game. It's open source. It's like running a race or a spitting contest. Who, whoever invented thumb wrestling brought forth a new thing and presented it to the children of tomorrow. This is like that. The idea was not to have to plan something, to not be violent, but to be more decorative and to not complicate the setup too much. The rules are posted online. I made it up so that I had something low stress, low stakes to draw in my sketchbook as sort of a focus exercise. Uh, I've drawn many of these, uh, but a lot of them are still uncollected. Here's a quick look at some other miscellaneous uh, comic books and zines. This is just a selection. Um, there's more. Uh, one of the main uh, projects I'm known for that I put the most effort into over the years is the uh, Ganges series. Uh, these are six issues that tell a story of Glenn Ganges unable to sleep. The first issue ends with Glenn in bed and he's unable to sleep. And then in each successive issue, he is still unable to sleep. He tries playing video games. He tries reminiscing. He tries relaxation techniques. He tries reading boring books and so on. But he has a hard time falling asleep. These were finally brought together to form, Vol to form Voltron to brought together into a graphic novel um, form in 2019 titled The River at Night. Uh, the first page that I drew is this page right here, up, up on the top row in the middle. And then I decided I needed more uh, before that, so I drew, drew these stories here. Uh, one of those stories was called Time Traveling. And time, the, the concept of time, the, the theme of time, uh, turned out to be the, the thing that I returned to over and over in the book. Uh, one thing I'll say about this body of work that I've never really said anywhere before, uh, a comics forum exclusive, is uh, that the covers to these issues had big heads of, of Glenn and Wendy, Wendy on the back and Glenn on the front. And along the way, I always thought of those heads as being actual size. So they were almost like masks. So like, if you hold them up, they kind of like are, are 
life size. And so the I was trying to subtly suggest that you are sort of like inhabiting those characters and seeing the world through their eyes. I never really made it explicit though by like, you know, making them actual masks or whatever, because that's, I don't know, that seemed a little corny to me. Um, <clears throat> the book is about a lot of things. Uh, there's some marriage stuff uh, between Glenn and Wendy. Actually, Wendy is asleep for most of the book, uh, but then she shows up for a lot of chapters five and six. There's also a bunch of research about the age of the earth, uh, because in the book, uh, Glenn is reading the book Basin and Range by John McPhee. Uh, and I highly, highly recommend John McPhee's books. Uh, they're incredible. So Glenn uh, reads about what McPhee calls deep time, uh, making sense of the millions of years, the hundreds of millions of years, uh, billions of years that, uh, the, that make up the age of the earth. It's crazy how to, to, to try to comprehend that amount of time. Uh, how mountains form slowly, slowly, slowly over time, stuff like that compared to the human scale. And in this book, I, I went back into science diagramming uh, for the geology stuff. When I show a page like this, uh, a spread, you take it all in at once, but it's really designed to be read linearly, like the stream that makes its way down the mountain to the sea. Spirals and circles are a formal motif in the book. And here's one of the main spirals of the book. No, you can notice too that it's a spiral made up of spirals. Uh, down here, you can see the spirals a little bit better, but they're alternating spirals of landforms back and forth all the way around. Um, in, in context, it's designed to really you know, blow your mind. The book uh, also has a fold-out dust jacket with printing on both sides. Here's here's a look at the at the folded-out dust jacket. Uh, you know, and it carries on the the theme of the river. There's a flood flooded farmland here, and here the animals are escaping from the flooded farmland to dry land. Here's the cutaway section of the uh, the soil, the rock. <clears throat> Here's the first issue of my new series, my new project, interrupted by 2020, but back on again, which, which serializes the next Glenn Ganges book, which will be named Fielder, Michiana. Glenn lives in the fictional town of Fielder in Michiana, you know, you know, Michiana. And the book will be about the town and about other stuff. Uh, jumping backwards a bit, um, I drew this book this brochure in 2006 for the Center for Cartoon Studies, which is in Vermont uh, with James Sturm, who runs the school. It's like a comic book that also introduces the school. Glenn, Glenn goes to the school in the story. Uh, it was my first exposure to the idea of teaching comics at the college level, which I'd later do. But anyways, uh, when I drew this, I was still just doing freelance work at times for extra money. Uh, and in the interest of realism in artist presentations, I'll say a bit about freelance work, <clears throat> some of my freelance work. But in general, when you're a cartoonist, if you're not super successful, they have a huge fan base, uh, you either do freelance illustration work on the side or teach to make money. That and doing custom drawings for obsessive fans or special requests. Uh, it's similar to to how when you write nonfiction books, even when you have a bestseller, you learn that the real money isn't in doing the research and writing the book, it's in the speaking fees. Anyways, the thing about being an artist is usually that you don't get paid a lot for what you want to do, but because you did that work and people respond to it, people will pay you to do what they want you to do, which often is, is more unsatisfying. It's an old story. At best, you find some way to negotiate this in-between space and develop professional skills and contacts, not lose your mind. Uh, the Simpsons story uh, was genuinely fun, though. Um, incidentally, this is the second comic I've done that refers to Mark Fisher, K-Punk, author of uh, Capitalist Realism, RIP. This was a Simpsons story I drew, uh, but it was written uh, by Matt Thurber, who's great. Over the years, I've been lucky to be able to turn down a lot of this work, though. Uh, it definitely pays better than alternative comics, though. Um, 
here's something from Marvel. Uh, Wolverine, whoops. Wolverine and Silver Surfer mixed with Fighter Run. I right, so moving on to teaching. <clears throat> I'd always wanted to try teaching and, and God knows I love a university library. So I was fortunate enough to get a chance to be a visiting artist at MCAD uh, in Minneapolis in 2015. I taught full-time at MCAD, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. They have a comics program, a uh, comics major, four-year program, which is one of the only full major programs devoted to comics in the country. It's put together by a series of professors since the 90s, including Terry Beatty, Peter Gross, uh, and mainly uh, in recent years, Barb Schultz uh, with Zach Sally and others. Uh, Anders Nilsson's also taught there, uh, Tom Kaczynski and which uh, has seen some interesting cartoonists pass through, uh, such as uh, you probably heard Rosemary Valero O'Connell or Marina Harkness. So I taught there for four years and I taught 20 classes over four years, including experimental comics, introduction to comics, advanced comics, character, um, and so on. I also finished three comic books and put together the river at night while I was there. The workload was pretty insane and barely sustainable. All, so all my respect to all the teachers out there, especially the ones who are finding time for their own work. Um, <clears throat> I tried to keep it simple when I taught, but the fact of the matter was I had a lot to say. I, I wrote a lot of notes and handouts and it all started to seem you know, like uh, tears and rain. Uh, so I started collecting them in 32 page zines for the students. I made 12 of them. They were called Comic School USA, and I made two each semester. Here's a, here's a picture of the bundle uh, of them all together on the right. I sell these bundles of 12 zines if you're interested. When I was teaching, uh, they were free to students, of course, and now I sell them, uh, but, and probably someday I'll edit them together into a book, but that's a little bit ways off, probably. Excuse me. These zines were featured in the uh, Journal of the Comic Studies Society, Inks, and I wrote a short introduction uh, for them, which I'll read a bit of. For me, comics means sitting happily for hours, pen in hand, combining calligraphy, good sentences, simple, elegant drawings that are at once badass, funny, alive, poetic at times, mundane at times, with confident, graceful lines in some kind of architecture, adding up to more than the sum of their parts. Comics for me is connected to the experience of having a pen or pencil in hand, happily hunched over a desk in a concentrated, focused way, filling up space in a way that amuses myself, that follows or imitates my favorite comics, that is onward leading, and that conceivably might bring a funny buzz to the brain of a reader, to you, the same kind of buzzing, blooming, little bursts of energy that open up onto a new space, new possibilities, new marching orders, frontiers, neighborhoods, a path through the trees, whatever I myself am getting from the music or from my life during the working week, whatever I get from favorite comics, favorite cartoonists or novels or old magazines, et cetera, et cetera, that buzzed me, that gave me a puzzle to decipher, gave me a happy mystery, a weird joke, good timing, the craft of cartooning as a path of practice. Also for me, comics means publishing these pages in a book, zine, or mini comic. The pages slowly accumulate and they talk to each other and the rough edges are smoothed and gray tones added mistakes fixed and stray marks nudged into place. And then they're made available for whoever wants one. And then doing this again and again, and they also accumulate. So publishing these zines uh, for the students was also a sort of practice what you preach activity for me. I focused on making and printing uh, finished comic books on paper, um, basically making, making mini comics. Uh, I believe a cartoonist needs to know the ins and outs of printing. For me, back in the Jewel Osco days in high school, that was my road to Damascus moment. And I knew that when the students made the journey from panel to page to story, 
printed comic book, even if it was just chapter one or a collection of odds and ends, that's when they would really come into their own. Make a comic book, rinse and repeat. Hold it in your hand. It's humbling, it's humbling. And you see all the places that you can improve, but hopefully you're excited to do that and do it again. I really believe that if we keep students' attention uh, on this, you know, eightfold path of comics in a, in a fun, supportive environment, and then work backward, that everything will flow from that. A healthy ecosystem of comics uh, includes these steps, ending up with some sort of reproducible unit, some package. Uh, it doesn't mean focusing on print alone. Of course, there can also be animated GIFs and posters or web comics and so on. Uh, um, over the years, I had taught myself to draw comics, but now I could teach students what I had found out. But it was tricky. Uh, I had that problem that is common in art instruction where someone who is, uh, well, somewhat advanced has to try to teach uh, beginners. Uh, I tried to do that by keeping it simple. So here are some of my simple rules. First, making comics. Don't think about it too much. Finish it and print multiple copies. Print about one third more than you think you should. Repeat. When in doubt, set out to make a zine, a comic book or a book, distribute it widely, but try not to lose money. Finish it and move on to the next one. Reach out in generosity and gratitude to your heroes and peers and do this anytime you are moved to do so. And then reading comics. Read a lot of comics and about comics. Look at older comics and learn from them. Learn simplicity and visual storytelling. Read good, bad, and mediocre comics and take inspiration, positive or negative, from them. I would tell the students to read good comics for obvious reasons. You read bad comics because they're, they're sort of inspiring uh, in a negative way, meaning when you read the bad comic, you think, I could at least do better than this. And then, you know, mediocre comics, 90% of comics are mediocre. And so when you read mediocre comics, you're at least reading something that you think like, if, if my comics aren't as good as this mediocre comic, then what can I do with my comics to make them better than mediocre? Uh, and lastly, read your peers' comics uh, and work harder than the average. Uh, so lastly here, I'd like to quickly run through my process, how I make comics. Um, it's not arbitrary. The reason I do the things the way I do is to make it easier on myself. Um, making comics is my favorite thing, and I've, I've, thought, I've thought a lot about how to do it. I think when you're a young cartoonist, especially, you're very hungry to hear about other cartoonist processes, uh, because making comics is such a complicated and agonizing thing, yet it's so absorbing and so rewarding at times, in the sense of personal satisfaction, mostly. Uh, the shortest path, um, the best path between two points is not necessarily the shortest or easiest. I've studied other cartoonists' uh, processes, and what's surprising sometimes is how some cartoonists seemingly make it harder on themselves than they need to, meaning they draw something many more times, and you think, hey, why not just skip all these steps, just skip to the end? But you start to see some wisdom in some of the long ways around. It's often a process of refinement. Uh, here's a shot of my studio back in 2015. Uh, it's changed locations a few times since then. And this wasn't even one of my best studios, but it, uh, it takes a lot of room. You have to spread out. There's paper everywhere usually. Here's some random shots. Here's some random shots of different cartoonist studios from my hard drive. I have a small collection of these pictures. When you look at other studios, you often pick up details and it can open up a whole other way of thinking. I remember when I first saw how Anders Nilsson, bottom left, hung all of his pages on the wall with binder clips. I was like, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> these are three of my main working, working mantras, if I can use that word. Uh, they are the uh, seven gates, uh, O-P-A-A-T, which basically means one thing at a time. And the most recent one, hold the book in your hand, which basically means make a lot of mock-ups. I usually start here when I sit down 
and I ask myself, what am I doing again? The answer is usually one of these three. So I'll run through the seven gates pretty quickly here. The idea behind the seven gates is half serious. I realize it's kind of a pretentious name, the, but the idea is that these are seven gates that you have to pass through to get to a finished page of comics. You can't really skip any of them. You can go through them pretty quickly, but you shouldn't try to skip them. Uh, and you only do as much as you need to do to get to the next gate. These gates, uh, the idea of these gates, it's helpful for troubleshooting when you have to figure out what the problem is, which you'll inevitably run into problems. So the so first one is uh, notes, scripts, beats. This is really just a brief sketch in words of the story. It could be as complicated as three lines of text or three words or many, many pages of typed pages. But you only really need to do enough that you feel like you're ready to sit down to start drawing. Um, the, less, the less the better, but at some point I need to have a few beats for the story, a sense that it goes from A to B to C, then D and so on. So I can start dividing it up into beats and pages and so on. This part should honestly be the shortest and the fastest. Here's what you end up with. Here's what you end up with when you're having a hard time figuring out the story. Sometimes you need a big piece of paper and you need to map it all out. Here's another. This is a writing program called Scapple that I really recommend. Any, again, this is more complicated than it should be. And it means that I'm like in, I'm in deep shit here. I've written myself into a corner. I'm trying to, to work myself, my way out to something simpler. The best is something simple that gets you to sit down and to actually start drawing. These notes here led to, uh, these notes led to these pages coming up a minute. I'm getting the, um, the beach ball, spinning beach ball. Those, those notes led to these pages, all the geology work. Okay, so number, oh man. <clears throat> Looks like uh, I lost the slideshow, so let me try to get, back, get it back. Apologize. My slideshow program crashed. Just give me a sec. No problem, Kevin. You can see we're close, <laughs> close to the end here. Uh, all right. The beach ball spinning again. Here we go, number two, thumbnails. This is really uh, what writing in comics form means. I have hundreds of these pages in my files. So some of you are smart and you're already thinking you could just skip the first gate and go right to thumbnailing, which is totally true. But the point is, the thing about these being gates, if you run into trouble at this stage and get stuck, the solution is that you need to go back and make sure you went through the first gate. Make, make sure that you have some sense of the basic beats, the basic ABC. <clears throat> so number, th so here's uh, here's some more thumbnails. Um, they usually look like this here, simple. But then there's also thumbnails which are in, in include all the writing, and this this is an important stage for me is to to draw the page in a basic way, but also to try to fit in all the lettering. <clears throat> page uh, gate three is actually laying out the pages of comics. 
Again, you can skip ahead to here if you have a sense of confidence about where you're going, but if you get stuck, you'll have to go back. Uh, I call this pencils one because I draw with pencils and paper, uh, but it's really not fully penciling yet. It's just drawing the basic layout, the basic structure, the basic readable, uh, the, the page at its most basic readable level. Next stage is inking in the borders and the words, or as we call it, the lettering. This is the basic skeleton of the page. Notice I'm still not really drawing. You draw around the lettering. So you get the lettering down. Lettering is a whole topic I won't go into, but it's very crucial. It's really important to get right. Moving on, um, pencils two. Now this is really drawing. All the structure is in place. So now we lightly draw in pencil. And of course, there's a lot of erasing too. You try to sculpt and get all the right lines in place, really fill in all the details, and everything that sets yourself up well enough that you can move on to the next part, which is inking. This is the real stuff. This is the finalizing of the drawings. Really, the previous stage and this stage are kind of blurred together in practice, but this is basically the stage where you get the whole thing as close as possible to finish. I use blue pencils sometimes. That's the blues you see here. It's an old standard technical drawing trick, but I didn't really use it until very recently. This stage takes the longest of all the stages, all of all the gates. Uh, it's an absolute joy for a cartoonist to get in the zone and settle in and put music on and just make good, lively, beautiful, confident ink lines and really get in the flow. And then the page starts to come alive. Lastly, there's this catch-all gate uh, that I just call finishing, which is things like adding tones or colors and fixing all the little mistakes that you need to touch up. I do a lot of it in Photoshop, of course. Uh, also important stuff like proofreading. Uh, and that's it, you're done. That's the seven gates. Uh, lastly, I'll just quickly talk about what I'm doing lately. Uh, in the last couple of years, in 2020 especially, I've really just been making what I call electronic zines or e-zines for people who subscribe uh, on my Patreon. Most of these are 32, pa 32, 40 pages of miscellaneous stuff along with some comics. Uh, these are some of them here. On the right here is just a nice gasoline alley page from the late 40s to look at. It's just nice to look at. <clears throat> Uh, and then the other weird thing I've been doing lately, uh, I have these big sheets of paper. Let me get to the next slide. I get these big sheets of paper where I've been doing a lot of thinking on paper. A lot of it just started out as warming up, but often I'm really thinking through everything that's on my mind, uh, getting it down on this on giant sheets of paper so that I can really like look at it and add to it each day. Here's another look at one of those here. Uh, and I've been doing these uh, most of the last year and there's quite a few of them now. And I, and I really don't know how I'm gonna publish them or what I'm gonna do with them, but uh, that's what I've been doing. Uh, and then here's some, some ph philosophy diagramming like I've been doing. Um, and that's it, that's my talk. Uh, I'm grateful to MSU for inviting me and to you, all of you, for your, your kind attention. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, imagine thunderous applause right now. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Fantastic. We really <laughs> appreciate your time here. And I've been keeping an eye on the YouTube chat and we have a few questions for you. So I'm going to start with one from Aaron Cashton, and I'm going to make a blanket apology for everybody's name that I butcher right now. Uh, so Aaron asks, what is Kevin's philosophy on lettering? What role yeah. do you think lettering plays? And this was asked before you mentioned the fact that lettering is its entire uh, an entire topic for you. So <laughs> I'll turn it loose to you. Well, um, like I was saying, I think one of the secret hearts of comics is calligraphy. Is um, It's kind of this, it's a way of trying to 
to say that you're, you're, it's this idea that you're not really drawing, you're drawing, but you're also almost writing and you're writing with pictures, you know? And so there's that part of it. <clears throat> and then I guess a, another issue with lettering, um, I love, I mean, I love lettering. I've always loved lettering. And so there's that. I just, it's part of the process that I love. And another aspect of lettering is that when I taught students, it was a struggle sometimes to get them to pay attention to lettering, to pay attention to um, how much work it took to design it correctly and get it just right. And um, so that, that sort of led me to emphasizing lettering as this sort of like secret heart of comics. You know, I think, I think it's also lettering is sort of one of the, the real places where if a comic looks sort of amateurish, it really looks amateurish in the lettering. And so really well-crafted lettering goes a long way. Um, I mean, you know, I think there's also a thing to cartooning in general or drawing, drawing pictures that are also made to be read that overlaps with a lot of the the craft of typography and of understanding how to handle letter forms and spacing and, and so on and so forth. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but that's what comes to mind right now with lettering, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. I was reading this Riverside Companion, which is essentially the notes for one of your most recent books, which you talked about, The River at Night. And in it, you were talking about how these different issues of Glen Ganges took you various amounts of time to produce. And one of them, chapter five, took you years to research. And I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about what the what went into those years of research. I'm guessing it's mainly due to that geologic sequence that you were showing a few images of. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about this passage in John McPhee's book where he, he talks about deep time, you know, the, the, the idea that the earth is very, very, very old. And that, you know, like a, everything that was discovered, that was, we didn't always know that. And, and there, that was discovered fairly recently. And so I kind of wanted to tell that story in the book, you know, the story of River at Night, like I said, it really, it, it turned out to be about time in a lot of ways, you know, time just kind of kept coming back as this, you know, object that you kind of looked at from different angles. And so if you look, if I looked at time in the book at, as like a short two minutes of time, it also made sense to look at hundreds of millions of years of time and to try to, you know, fit that into the, the way that comics is, are like stick, staccato time, you know, like moments, 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 and it's all elastic within comics. So I wanted to play around with this idea of hundreds of millions of years and also do that through um, talking about the discovery of the age of the earth. And so it was mostly, um, I was leaning very, very heavily on John McPhee's book for that. <clears throat> and then as I started researching it, I kind of, there's a book by Stephen Jay Gould who he kind of takes issue with John McPhee's book and says that John McPhee doesn't really get some, he doesn't get it completely right. And so then that led to me having to figure out what, I, you know what I mean? So I, so I read the John McPhee book and then I read the Stephen Jay Gould book, which said that some of this stuff was wrong, but then I had a new situation where I had to, was like, is any of this wrong? You know, so then I had to check that work. And so I had to just like check work and I had to we read widely to kind of like triangulate what I really thought the story actually was. And um, admittedly, I didn't really need to do all the reading that I did. You know, I'm sure all of you are scholars or whatever, know what it's like to just, you, you read and you read and you read and you don't know when to stop or when, but then it's kind of addictive also because 
you might stumble on something and then that opens up a whole new world and then you're like oh no you know so uh that's what that was that was going on there you know and then i also had to just make sure that i understood the basics and um and also knew how to draw what i was going to draw you know so it took a while We've got another another question from Vegetable who asks, uh, sure. says, sometimes the process of cartooning can be tedious, for me at least. Have you discovered anything that makes the going more interesting or sustainable? And I know you kind of touched on that with your seven gates and OPAT and HBIYH. Uh, is there anything you wanted to expand on regarding that? Well, I've always kind of joked that um, I draw comics so that I can listen to music. Like I really actually want to just want to sit for hours and listen to music and comics is like an, my excuse, you know? So, you know, I'm, I'm always listening to music and trying to find new music to listen to and stuff. And um, so there's that, but then there's also, you know, audiobooks and podcasts. And so sometimes it's like, that's actually what you're interested in doing. And then you're like, well, since I'm going to be doing this, I might as well just, sit at the desk and keep working so i don't i don't know that's something that helps hmm. i i think the other thing that i've learned over the years is you you can definitely burn yourself out and so it's a good thing to learn to quit when you're ahead or quit at a certain point so that you still have enough energy to do it the next day because if you if you're going eight to twelve hours day after day after day to meet a deadline you're just going to burn out but if you do four to six hours a day it's sustainable. Ingrid Jorgensen says, uh, how do you keep your in-progress pages organized in your studio? <laughs> I'll show you. One, one thing I do is I use a binder that's basically the comic book itself. And so it's got all the pages in it. And then I just, I just add to the pages as I go, but these are printouts. I don't know where my, you know, the actual pages are quite large. And so those go into a bigger binder. And it's just like, I know I know the comic book's gonna be 32 pages. So I, I make 32 plastic sleeves and then I just start putting things in their slots and fill in the space. Zach Dubison says, how much of a story do you have structured in your head before you begin? You said you start and let the story unfold as you work, question mark? Uh, I've done both. And I think it works either way. Um, some of my best stuff has started with where I didn't know what I was doing at the beginning and I just started something and let it unfold. But I've often, I've also worked where I kind of knew where I was going um, often what I've done has to be 32 pages. And so sometimes I have all these ideas and I have to edit it down to fit into 32 pages. So it also helps to have a, a container to fit everything into, I guess. We've got a question from Jonah who is helping us out behind the scenes here. He says, what made you first want to put together comics with video games? Do you see any particular potential with those two media working in tandem as tech evolves? Uh, I've never really thought about it, to be honest. I mean, there's obviously those 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 um, those video games where there's they're pan they're comics video games where they're panels, and I, they used to have those for like Genesis or whatever Sega Genesis. Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, I I grew up in. I grew up in the 80s and 90s and played Atari, you know, I played Atari and Nintendo and Genesis and on and on. So video games have always been part of my world. And um, I haven't really thought about the overlap that much. I mean, there's also, there's off, there's obvious overlaps, I guess, but um, yeah, I don't know, unsatisfying answer, but I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> well, I've got a question for you. Um... I know you said you sort of left autobio pretty early on in your comics career, but how much of Kevin Heisinga is there in Glenn Ganges? Um, I don't know, not much. 
but then uh, you know obviously at times there's a lot it's like any kind of fiction writing i think where you're creating a character and you only know what you know you know you don't know what you don't know and so but glenn is there's no way that glenn and me overlap where um i'm i'm very different than him and i'm and the things that have happened to him are very different but at the same time like you know i don't know i'm we're the same age and live in the suburbs and so on and so forth and like anybody like everybody we have been unable to sleep at times you know um so i don't know i try to think of him as as less as not me writing about me but as him me using him to to get at things that i want to write about um sam spina asks what are you listening to right now? What am I listening to right now? Uh, good grief. I don't know. Uh, I listen to uh, a doom metal band, Yob. Um, I listen to the new Avalanches album, which I like a lot. Uh, I've been listening to Brahms Requiem. Uh, yesterday, I listened to my special request to uh, Jungle D Drum and Bass Sky. Um, yeah, there's a lot, of, right. a lot of metal. We'll hope that's enough for Sam. Uh, Laura says, you mentioned Patreon and online and given the current circumstances. Have you found difficulty recultivating an online following? I've never thought about cultivating an online following. Never thought about it or had to, or, or rethought about it or anything like that. I, it's just, I, don't, I think it's, <clears throat> it scratches some of the itch that zine, that you, you know, you wanna make zines. So you just kinda wanna say something and put it out there in the world. And the internet has always felt like just a, publish, a way to publish stuff. Um, but you know, I've never really been comfortable with the idea of like cultivating an audience or like having a relationship with audience. And if anything, I I would I would not like that. Brandon asks, do you still game now? And do modern games continue to inform your comics work? Um, I I for a while I said that I was video game sober which I, I sort of was for a, a few years. And, um, and only recently this year, I, start, I played uh, Breath of the Wild. And um, so that was kind of my getting back into it. Um, and in my recent comics, I, I did draw something that was based on Breath of the Wild, but it was only really based on like, I, you know, in, in the game, you hunt deer. And in the, in the comic, I had to draw a deer getting shot by an arrow. So I really just like literally used a screenshot from the game, you know, but um, yeah, that's, that's it so far. Okay. Uh, during your talk, you showed that spiraling land mass uh, to represent, you know, land, but also time and this deep sense of time. Uh, I was curious about the significance of the spirals of land within the spiral of time. What you what were you trying to represent with the spirals of land that you saw as those layers started to progress down? The what those are is that the guy who I'm talking about in the story, whose name is Hutton, he had this uh, theory about the way that the world worked that like there was this cycle of uplift and erosion. And that that cycle just happened constantly going back and back into time. You know what I mean? I mean, it's true that there is uplift of land that then gets eroded, right? But it's not the case that that ha has happened for eternity. You know, it hasn't happened for an infinite number of years. It's only happened for 4 billion years or whatever. And so in the story, I was trying to illustrate his idea that it was infinite and that it was just an infinite cycle of uplift and erosion. And so those spirals are kind of like the, the you know, the infinite up, 
the infinite cycle that he was talking about. Looks like we've got one more question from YouTube. Lynn Wolf. Hi, Lynn. Uh, Lynn asks, do you archive your work in the sense, do you keep all sketches after a work is complete so that you can look back at the process? Yeah. Yeah. It's all in, it's all in uh, folders in a filing cabinet. And, um, you know, I sell original art, so I don't always have all that stuff left. Um, but I do have a lot of stuff. And especially with River at Night, I have a lot of extra material. And that's the idea behind these zines. The, I'm, I'm working on the second one right now. And so I have a lot of extra material related to the section of the book that's about mirrors and mirroring. Uh, and so this, is, this issue will be a lot about that, um, all that extra material about mirrors. All right, a couple more questions popped up and then I'm gonna cut it off after that so that we can let Kevin go here. But Andrew and Sean, you guys are gonna have the last questions. Andrew says, Kevin, when you are composing your comic book pages, do you arrange them as two page spreads either during layouts or thumbnails? I started that with, um, excuse me, I started that, you know, I started that around the time of Ganges five. So I always just went page by page. And then around the time of Ganges 5 and especially Ganges 6, I really started composing spreads at a time. And nowadays, when I use my, you know, when I use this binder to, to look at stuff, I'm always looking at it as a spread. And sometimes I alter things so that the spread looks better, you know. And last question here for the evening is from Sean Gilmore, who says, how do you think about the length of each segment, especially of the Glenn Ganges stories? Does length hinge on how experimental the content is? Really, the answer is just that length is usually decided already. So like I said before, like the books that I do are usually 32 pages and sometimes 40 but they're usually 32 pages. And so I, it's usually that I have 32 pages to work with and then I want to fit some stuff in there and I just have to make it work, you know? Um, it's rarely the case that I just like let a story go out as long as I want, you know, as it can. I usually am, am already working within a parameter. Even when I'm working with an anthology or some other kind of project, it's usually you have some sort of like cutoff and then I try to work within that. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, you know, thank personally, you. I've been a big fan of your work for years, seems like Thanks. decades. And I'm so happy to have you here as part of the MSU Comics Forum. Really glad you could join us here. And I know that a lot of people watching right now are too from the number of questions that are coming in. So thank you for being with us today. And uh, thank you, thank you everybody. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thunderous applause. <laughs> yes, and for you too.